God is doing a new thing, the promo video says, and it involves you. And that is such a perfect segue into today's message. What God wants to do next involves you. And we talk about it all the time here at Family Worship Center. When we read the Bible, a lot of us read it like it's some ancient history book, like the stories happened so long ago, like it's just a, a book to be read. But what we learn as we read through the stories is that God is still writing the same Bible. The same stories that you read about are taking place in your life, and you are the ones in the story. We, we talk about Moses all the time standing at the Red Sea and God, God parting the Red Sea through his faith. And, and we know that if we stand at the banks of our Red Sea and we do the same thing Moses did, God will do the same thing for us that he did for Moses. We know that when we read about Noah building the ark and when Noah followed God's instructions, when the storm came, Noah was safe and his family was saved. And we know the same story happens in our life. If we follow the instruction God gives us, when, when life rains down on us and the storms come, we know that. But we know now, when we do the same thing Noah did, God does the same thing for us that he did for Noah. What God wants to do next involves you. You're the characters in the story that he's writing right now. And it's such an awesome thing. Some of you are thinking, what in the heck? He's not going to do dad jokes? Some of you are happy. Listen, if you're new to Family Worship Center, we have a bit of a tradition that just started about six weeks ago. I open up every service with some dad jokes. Some of you are like, oh, man, he remembered the dad jokes. But I'll tell you something, church. Something cool happened as we started this new tradition. I have, I'm not kidding you, my wife thinks I'm lying, but I am serious. I have dozens of people message me now their own dad jokes. Here's some that came from you. One that I just got this morning. Why couldn't the bike stand up by itself? was too tired. <laughs> Round of applause for Whitney, yes. I told Whitney when she told me the joke, I'm using it and expect people to boo you because they will. <laughs> no, seriously, a lot of people think I'm crazy, but I absolutely love a good elevator joke. They work on so many levels. <laughs> Jim Ely, yep, yep. He's like, oh no, he's going to tell mine. <laughs> No, but seriously, elevator jokes are good, but knock-knock jokes are incredible. Whoever invented them should be given a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Matt, that's you, buddy. Jackie's like, that's you? <laughs> yep, that was Matt. No, but seriously, you guys, we should be kind to each other. You know, I was walking into Hux the other day with my son. We held the door open for a clown. It was a nice gesture. That's Matt as well. Matt, you're in some trouble. <laughs> With, and some of you are like, that's all we came for. We're leaving. We got the dad jokes. We're out of here. You know who's excited about the tent revival coming up next week in Matt 2? Yes. It's going to be incredible. Just a reminder, we don't have service here next Sunday morning. We're having one big worship, one big service at the Matt 2 campus for the tent revival. We'll have both congregations there at the same time. It's going to be a powerful weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's going to be awesome. If you need a ride to the Mattoon campus, let us know. We will get you there. But a reminder, if you show up here for church Sunday morning, you're probably going to be here by yourself because we'll be at the Mattoon campus. You know, God has us in such an incredible season here at Family Worship Center. Those of you who've been paying attention to our Facebook page, we brought back the fifth quarter last weekend for the Charleston High School students. Yes. Fifth quarter was a tradition that I absolutely loved when I was a student. We brought it back for the high school students. We had 83 Charleston High School students show up for free pizza, a live DJ, an awesome dance, and just a safe place for students to go on a Friday night. It was awesome. But he's doing so much more. If you go through the basement, the basement here at Family Worship Center is coming alive. The library looks incredible. If this is your first time here, I want to encourage you to go downstairs and check out our basement. We've got a, a full library down there that's absolutely incredible. The arcade's coming to life. The children's classrooms are incredible. God is doing some really amazing things, and it's because of you and your generosity that we're able to continue building this place the way God wants it. It's absolutely incredible. You know, I want to ask... The, the title of the sermon this week is Recipe for Revival. And as we go through the sermon, I want you to ask yourself a question over and over. I want you to ask yourself, am I deprived or am I revived? 
Have I allowed the world to deprive me and make me forget about the promises of Scripture? Or have I allowed Jesus Christ to revive me and use me to make sure other people understand that the Bible was written to them too? Have I allowed Christ to really revive my life? Or have I allowed the world to deprive me of what God's got in store for me? There are people in your life right this very second church that have been deprived of the gospel. They have allowed the world to beat them up, to push them down on the ground, to trick them into thinking there's no possible way that the Bible was written to me. I understand he wrote it to other people. I understand that it applies to other people's lives. But I've been too bad. I'm too far gone. It's too late for me. There are people in your life right now that think that way. And maybe you think that way. Listen, if you sit in here this morning and you don't think the Bible was written to you, you are absolutely 100% incorrect. The Bible was written to you. It was written for you. And once you read it and understand the promises God makes to you, there's no possible way you can just sit back and not share that news with other people. When Jesus Christ changes your heart and you understand these promises are mine, you, you, God, God gives you a passion to share those promises with other people. Today we're going to focus on two stories as we, as we talk about revival and how your revival will save other people. Your relationship with Christ will save other people's souls. And we're going to focus on two stories that shows us exactly how that happens. The first story we're going to go to is in Genesis chapter 37, verses 17 through 28. We're going to talk about Joseph. And we're going to talk about Joseph getting thrown into the bottom of the well, discarded by his very own family. But then we're going to look at what God did. We're going to look at God's plans for Joseph. And we're going to remember now what you do, what God did for Joseph, he will do for you if you follow the same instructions. So we're going to focus on those instructions today. And we're going to figure out how God is going to use our current situations to save other people. We go to Genesis chapter 37. Verses 17 through 28, Scripture says, They've moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached him, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we will see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. <clears throat> Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take, back, take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming to Gilead coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were, they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. The first place God stops us here in this story is verses 23 through 24. I'm going to read it one more time. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty and there was no water in it. They took from Joseph, his own brothers, his own family took from him the most valuable thing he had. The robe that his father gave him. His brothers were so jealous. They couldn't stand this dreamer. And you know why they couldn't stand him? God had shown Joseph some things that were going to happen in his life. And when Joseph shared those things with his brothers, they became angry. They became jealous. They didn't like him at all. The world will do the same thing to you, church. When you go and share the gospel, you will have people that reject you. You will have people that do not like to hear what you have to say. You will have people that will take you and throw you as deep as they can possibly get you to try to get rid of you. They'll take all your hope from you, or they will try if you allow them to. Do not allow the world to throw you into that well, church. But some of us think, I'm already here. It's already too late. I'm already down here in this well. I've been rejected. I, I've been discarded, maybe even by my own family. They took from Joseph everything he loved, or they tried to. And there he sat, 
at the bottom of this dark, damp well, rejected by the people that he thought loved him. Some of us sitting in this room right now feel the exact same way. And if you're not there now, you have been at some point in your life. You feel like the world's ignored you. You feel like the world has tried to throw you away, to discard you. They didn't care what you had to say. They've taken everything or tried to that make us happy. The things we used to love to do, the world constantly tries to take from us. Two years ago, church buildings were empty. Kids couldn't go to school. The places we would gather with friends were closed. Maybe it's even your own family members that have thrown you into the bottom of the well. Your mom and dad always reminding you of your previous addictions. Your spouse always letting you know you don't measure up. Your boss always making sure you know that you're not meeting the standards. Somebody at some point in time in your life has thrown you into a well. But there's good news this morning, church. Joseph didn't stay in that well. Joseph didn't stay in the bottom of that dark, damp well the rest of his life, and neither will you. We go to verse 28 in this story. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels. He sold him to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Joseph gets pulled back up out of that well. He doesn't stay down there forever. He's finally pulled out of the well and free again, but he's sold into Egypt. I know what some of you are thinking. Yeah, sure, his brothers pulled him up out of the well, but, but they didn't do it because they liked him. They didn't do it because they felt bad for what they had done. They pulled him up out of the well just so they could sell him off, just so they could get rid of him forever. And although all of that is true, although that is the exact reason that his brothers pulled him out of the well, I want us to remember Romans chapter 8, verse 28, because this is what God was up to in Joseph's life, and this is exactly what God is up to in your life all the time. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have, thank you, who have been called according to his purpose. God, in all things, scripture says right here, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So the only question that's even relevant right now in your life is do you love God? Do you love God? Are you passionate about what he's doing? Or are you passionate about his word? Because scripture says right here, if I love him, it doesn't matter what's happening in my life, God's going to use it for my good. The same thing happened to Joseph. The same thing will happen for you that happened to Joseph. Even though his brothers despised him, and the only reason they pulled him up out of the well was to sell him off, God says, hey, I know you love me, Joseph, and I am going to use this for your good. But something crazy happens in this story. Not only did God use this situation for Joseph's good, he ends up using it for the good of the exact same people that hated Joseph. We go back, we fast forward in the story real quick, in the story of Joseph. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Listen what Joseph says uh, to his brothers. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. L look at the correlation, Romans 8, 28, and what Joseph said. Joseph understood what God was doing in his life. He knew, hey, I know you meant this for my harm, but I don't really care. Because I know the God I serve. I know for a fact that when I get through this valley, God is going to use it to save lives. Church, the same exact story is happening now in your life. I know we go through trials in life, but I promise you, if you stay tethered to Scripture and you understand what God is up to behind the scenes, you realize, yep, I know I'm going through this valley, but at the end of the story, God is going to save souls through my testimony. Lots of you have shared your testimony. And I'm telling you what, it's a powerful thing. When you get through your valley, when you finally get out of that well, at the end of your story, there is victory. And it's not just your victory. It's victory for everybody you share your testimony with. So what happened that led Joseph to tell his brothers that? What, what, ha what happened in between Joseph in the well and him telling his brothers, yeah, I know you, you meant this for my harm, but God used it for my good. What happened? Lots of stuff. Genesis chapter 41, verse 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. And by the end of the story, 
Pharaoh had put Joseph in charge of the entire land. God was working behind the scenes. God knew what was going to be needed in years to come, so he put Joseph in charge of the entire land. God puts Joseph in a position to save lives. While Joseph was in charge of the land, you see, he started storing up grain. He started storing up food. And lo and behold, later on, a famine hits the land. And by the end of the story of Joseph, Joseph's brothers, the very same people that wanted to get rid of him, the very same people that intended to harm him, that wanted him as far away as possible, the very same people that hated him, by the end of the story, those same people were relying on Joseph to save their lives. They, they end up having to go to Egypt to keep from starving. And they beg, they beg the man in charge of Egypt, would you please sell us some food? What they didn't realize is that person that they were talking to, the person they were begging for survival, the person that they were begging for food was the exact same brother they had gotten rid of years ago. Joseph's brothers, his entire family had become deprived. But lucky for them, Joseph had been revived. Lucky for them, Joseph knew God and served God. It was because of his faith that they were able to survive the famine. There are people in your life, church, that are depending on your faith. There are people in your life, maybe, maybe you don't even think they like you right now. Maybe they, maybe they want to discard you. I promise you, church, at the end of your story, those same people that hate you are going to be dependent on your faith and your knowledge of scriptures to survive. We have to take that responsibility seriously. Don't, don't sit and, and complain that you're at the bottom of the well. Don't sit and feel sorry for yourself that you've been thrown down into this pit. Understand, listen, I know the situation's not great. I know I'm not having a whole lot of fun down here in this well, but I do know one thing. God's bringing me out of here, and no matter what happens from now to the end of my story, I know for a fact God's going to use it for my good. I know for a fact God's going to use me to help save lives because we serve the same God Joseph served. Scripture tells us uh, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. The same exact God that brought Joseph out of the well, that's the same God you pray to. So we know what he does, church. He's going to do the same thing for us. Your family needs your revival. Your marriage needs your revival. Your kids need your revival. And your very own enemies, the people that hate you, need your revival. They hate you now, I get it. But by the end of the story, God's going to use you to bring them to the cross, church. Do not allow the world to deprive you. Do not allow the world to convince you that you're too far gone. Do not allow the world to allow you to start feeling sorry for yourselves. Do not allow them to deprive you and make you forget about the promises of Scripture, church. Allow Jesus Christ to revive you right now today. You know, Mark was talking about the revival in Matt 2 tomorrow. Listen, this, this, this revival, I want to make sure that we're careful that this revival is not like the finish line. I want to make sure that after the revival, we don't think, well, that was a fun revival. The revival is just the beginning, church. This tent revival is just the beginning of a new season in your spiritual life. This tent revival is just kind of like the pregame party. This revival, if we do it right and we take it seriously, will last for the rest of our lives, church. And it will change people's lives. I want to go to another example of, of what your revival will do for other people. Probably my favorite story in the Bible. Some of you are thinking, he says that about every scripture. <laughs> I do. I'll admit it. My favorite story in the Bible is the last story in the Bible I read. But seriously, one of my favorite stories is David and Goliath. We all know the story. The Israelites were facing off against the Philistines, and every single day, Goliath would come out and take his stand. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 16. For 40 days, Scripture says, the Philistine came forward every morning and every evening and took his stand. Every single day, the Israelite army had to look at the same exact problem. And it scared them. They were terrified. They thought, there is no possible way we can defeat this giant. 
There's no possible way we can overcome this problem. There are people in your life right now that are going through the same thing, church. Scripture tells us the Word of God is alive and active. The Bible, that's the Bible, alive and active. There are people in your life right now going through the exact same thing that the Israelite army was going through. They wake up every day and there's that addiction staring them right in the face. They go to bed at night, there it is again, staring me in the face. And, and I don't know how to overcome this problem. I, matter of fact, I don't, think, I don't think anymore it's even possible for me to, it's just who I am. I'm just destined to stare at the same problem every single day. They wake up in the morning, yep, there's the marital problems. Go to bed at night, marital problems. Wake up in the morning, yep, I'm still addicted. Go to bed at night, still addicted. Wake up in the morning, I'm still battling greed, lust, anger, whatever it is. There are people in your life that are, have been looking at the same giant for years and years. And they don't know how to defeat it. That's fine. Listen, church, do you know how to defeat it? Can you maybe help them out in this area? The Israelite army had convinced themselves, this is who we are. We're never going to get past this giant. And as they faced that giant every single day, your loved ones began, began to experience the same emotions the Israelite army did. Hopelessness. Depression, anger, because they've allowed the world to deprive them, church. They're counting on you. They're counting on you for their hope. They're counting on you, your revival, to save them from the giant they've been staring at. You see, in this story, David is sent to his brothers by his father, and his dad says, Hey, take your brother some food, take him some supplies. David shows up onto the scene and he realizes, my gosh, you guys have been staring at this giant for 40 days? What, what in the world's going on here? David doesn't just show up and say, yep, yeah, man, that, yeah, well, ooh, it sucks to be you, bros. I'm out of here. Dad just told me to come and bring you some supplies. I No, I'm not dealing with this. I'm going back home. That's not what David did. David showed up and he said, oh, you guys are dealing with a problem? Let me see what I can do to help you. David springs into action, church. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant, me, David is saying, I'll go fight him. David shows up and he says, hey, I'll go fight the giant my brothers are facing. I'm not scared of this thing. David had been revived, church. David was in an active relationship with Christ, and he knew, ah, there's no, there's no problem too big for Christ. There's no issue that we can't get past. Why? Because he knew God went with him wherever he went. Guess what? He promises to do the same thing for you. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 4 says, The Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to give you victory. David knew, ah, no, I'm not fighting this giant on my own. God's with me. I have a relationship with Christ. David's brother's survival depended on David's faith and knowledge of Scripture, church. It, the same thing is true in your family. Your faith will bring down giants in other people's lives. Your knowledge of Scripture will bring people hope in the face of that giant that they face every day. David knew the promises of Scripture, and, and so he volunteers to confront Goliath. We read the story, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 40 through 50. Then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream and put them in his pouch. And with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him, you see the Philistine, the giant, brought friends. He kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said back to the Philistine, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin. But listen to what David says. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you've defied. This day, David says, the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. 
All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, listen what David does. David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he, str he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Church, David's brothers had been staring at this same problem for a long time. David shows up for a couple days and says, let's just take God to the battle line and we'll defeat this thing. And he did exactly that. Listen, there's a couple important parts in this story though. David ran quickly to the battle line. He didn't waste any time. He didn't say, hey, listen, let's form a committee. We need to form a committee and then we'll vote a few times. And then however the committee decides to attack this problem, that's what we'll do. David didn't do that. He didn't say, you know what, I'm going to post a poll on Facebook. And <laughs> there wasn't Facebook back then. He didn't say, I'm going to do a poll and, and then whatever the majority thinks, that's how we'll do things. He didn't post a duck lip, lip, safety, or duck lip selfie on Instagram and ask for people's opinions. He didn't do any of that. He said, you know what? I know exactly what the Bible tells us to do. I know exactly what God tells me he'll do through us. So let's just run to the battle line and get this thing over with. As the Philistine, as the giant approached David, David ran quickly to meet him because he know, listen, I got Christ on my side. I'm not wasting any time at all. God promises to be with me wherever I go, and I'm taking him right up to this issue, and we're going we're gonna to bring this giant down. That's exactly how we are to confront our problems, church. Do not be scared of the giant that rears its ugly head every day for you. You have Jesus Christ right there in your pouch just like David did. Take your stones with you right up to that giant and, and say just like David did, listen, in the name of God, you're going down, sucker. Guess what will happen? That giant will fall, guaranteed, because God doesn't lose. Jesus Christ, thank you. You're not the first person on this planet that God is going to lose. It, you know, that's how we think about our problems. So, yeah, I know, I know Lois won her deal. Yep, yep, I know Melissa and Leslie. They win all the time. Dennis wins. Yeah, but not me. Listen, you're not the first one God's going to lose for, all right? Because God doesn't lose at all. We are, thank you, John. <clears throat> David's brothers had forgotten this. They had forgotten we serve God. So when they woke up every day, they were scared and defeated. Church, there are people in your life that have become deprived just like that. It's our job as, as believers to continue to remind people, Hey, listen, brother, you remember what the Bible says about you? Hey, sister, listen, do you remember what Jesus Christ says about you? Because if not, I'm going to remind you. I want to remind you that God's with you wherever you go. Let me tell you the story about David, bro. Let me, the, let me tell you the story about Joseph, sister. You are going to be victorious. Do not allow the world to steal from you what God has planted in your heart and soul, which is victory. Lucky for D David's brothers, his brothers, his brother David had been revived through Christ. And it was because of his bravery. It was because of his revival and passion and reliance on Christ that his brothers, giants, fell. David knew God, and he knew the powers that he had through God. And because of that, David's brothers survived. Because of your faith, church, someone in your family will get to experience heaven. Because of your bravery, someone in your family or close group of friends will someday soon be able to experience sobriety again. Because of your faith and reliance on Scripture, somebody in your family will finally be able to get past depression, anger, anxiety. We serve a God, church, that literally spoke everything into existence. That's who you pray to. It's time we move past these wimpy prayers. We have to understand, I'm praying to the God that spoke the sun and the earth and me into existence. Listen, we're going to shoot for the stars. When you pray, pray big prayers. We serve a God that can do anything he wants. And we have to pray with bravery and courage. Here's what I did for a majority of my life. There would be an issue in my life, and I would pray these really small, wimpy prayers. And I'll tell you why. 
Because I always worried, if God doesn't answer this, what are people going to think? If I tell people what I've prayed for and then it doesn't happen, how do I explain that to people? God taught me a lesson very clearly that I will remember the rest of my life. And it was my grandma, and she had experienced a medical condition with her intestines. The doctor said, yeah, this probably ends in one of three ways. Uh, she dies, or she'll be on a feeding tube the rest of her life, or a miracle happens and she'll just be better. And I thought, oh boy, what do we pray for? Which one do we pray for? I'm serious. I, I went through this, and I thought, man, I think maybe I'll just shoot for the feeding tube. In my mind, that was the most logical outcome. Maybe I'm just going to pray for that, because then if, if anything more than that happens, it'll be good. But if she's stuck with the feeding tube, I could say, yep, God answers prayers. I tried to take the easy way out. God said, don't be such a wimp. Yeah, thanks, Lois. Lois says, well, you need to listen to that. <laughs> Lois is such an encourager. <laughs> God said, don't shoot so low. Go home and get on your knees in your living room and pray that your grandma gets a full recovery. And I thought, oh, boy. I was nervous wrecked to do it, but I did it. I told just a couple people about that prayer because I was still in the back of my mind thinking, eh, not likely to happen. I didn't tell a whole lot of people. A couple days later, <clears throat> I went with my mom and dad to the hospital to visit Grandma Sarah. There she sat in the room, in her hospital room, drinking a cup of coffee. The doctors have no idea how it happened. But it, yes, thank you, Lois. And I'm telling you something, church, it was from that moment I realized we are talking to the God that can do anything he wants to do. Why do we limit him in our own minds? Why do we do that? Why do we put God in such a small little box and carry him around? Why are we so, why are we so scared to pray for the big things in life? We have to understand that Jesus Christ changed the entire world when he, on that cross, he yelled out as loud as he can, it's finished, I've done all the work. Now all you have to do is put your faith in me. That's all you have to do. I don't care how big your giant is. I don't care if that sucker is 50 foot tall. God will bring it down. As long as you're brave enough to run quickly to the battle line and start slinging those, what are the stones we sling at them? Faith, hope, grace, mercy, the promises of Scripture. Throw all the promises of Scripture at your giant church and you just watch how fast that sucker falls. Your faith and your revival is important. You need it. Your family needs it. The city needs it. The state needs it. And the world needs it. Your revival will literally save human souls. As I prepare to close, I want us to remember this week Joseph and David. Joseph goes from the bottom of that stinky well to saving the very people that threw him there. You will not be in your well forever, church. Some of you are thinking, listen, I've been here a long time. I've been in this bottom of the well for what seems like ever. It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. God is the only thing that matters. Jesus Christ is the only thing that matters. And as long as you stay reliant on Him, God didn't create you just so you could be some mediocre human being in the bottom of the well. God says, listen, I, know, I knew you even before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And then he goes on to say, I know the plans I have for you. God didn't write your story and think, you know what, it, I, I think this is what I'm going to plan for Brandon. At about 20, I'm going to have him thrown in this well, and I'm just going to leave him down there. God doesn't write those types of stories. Here's what God writes. Yeah, I know eventually you're going to be thrown into a well. We all fall short of his glory. We're all sinners. And he says, I know you're going to find yourself down in here. But my plans for you are to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. That's what God says about you. And he says, I already knew the plans I had for you before I even formed you in the womb. Listen, if you're in a situation right now that's not hopeful and not prosperous, your story is not done yet. You're coming out of that place. God doesn't write... God hasn't forgotten about you. 
I promise you, he's not distracted and he didn't forget about you down there. He's pulling you out, church. His plans for you have not changed. He knew you before he formed you. Think about that. Just the magnitude of that one statement in Scripture. He knew me personally before he formed me. Yes, he did. And that's the same God that spoke the Son into existence. And yet we think, nope, I'm just destined to be in this world forever. You are not. You're coming out of there. And then when you do come out of there, make sure you let God use you the way Joseph did. Even if, it, man, I don't know, I feel like I'm out of the well, but I still don't feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be. You think Joseph was real excited to be sold off into Egypt? You think he was pumped up about that? No! He probably thought, this is disastrous. But then God moved. Then God said, no, you're right where I, no, you're right where I need you. You're right where your brothers need you. You're right where all my children need you. I put you in a position to save everybody. Keep walking, church. Continue walking the path God has set for you. And I know sometimes it seems like, nah, I don't think this is it. Keep walking it. What about David? You know, David was ridiculed almost. He was the smallest of all his brothers. He was overlooked time and time and time again. His brothers were stronger. His brothers were taller. His brothers were probably better looking than him. And he is the one God used to save all those people, to save, to save the entire tribe. God sent the smallest, probably the weakest. I don't care how insignificant the world has, has treated you. I don't care if the world continues to tell you, you're just a loser. You can't do anything. Look how small you are. Scripture says just a mustard seed size of faith is all you need. And Scripture says if you, do, if you have just that, just that small mustard seed of faith, you can tell a mountain to move and it'll move. Because God's the one that moves it. If we play our hands of life the way God wants us to play them, eventually, in your life, people will say the same thing about you and your life that they said about Joseph. Is that possible? You're darn right it's possible. Because it's the same God writing your story that wrote Joseph's. And the story's already been written. They will say the same thing about you they said about David, about Moses, about Noah. If we play our hands and we go where God wants us to go, people will have no doubt in their mind, I have experienced the love, grace, and mercy and hope of Jesus Christ. And they will experience that through your obedience. Let me ask you a question. Do you think David's brothers doubted the power of God after they saw David take down that giant? No. What about Joseph? You think his brothers still despised him after he saved their lives? You think they doubted the God Joseph served after God used Joseph to save them? What about the people behind Moses that followed him through the Red Sea? How excited do you think they were when they, wait a second, we're just going to stand here and you're just going to hold your staff? The Egyptian army's right behind us, dude. Think about the situation all those people were in. Over here's the Red Sea. We walk into there, we drown. Over here's the, Israel, or the Egyptian army. If we turn this way, we get murdered or taken back into captivity. How excited do you think those people were to stand behind Moses? Probably not real excited. But Moses said, no, I know. Listen, I know this looks crazy. I get it. I know you're scared, but God's telling me just to stand here and hold my staff out and he'll provide a way. Guess what God did? Exactly what he said he would do. Moses stood there and just held the staff out. He provided it away. And then everybody that stood behind him walked through the same dry ground. You have a line of people behind you right now, whether you know it or not, that are waiting on your faith to clear the way for them. And then once they walk through that path behind you, you understand they will never doubt the God you serve ever again. That's the responsibility we have as Christians. Share what God is doing in your life. Allow people to see it. Knowing that, hey, I know, listen, I know you think I'm nuts right now, but just wait till we get to the other side, brother. You'll be coming to church with me on Sundays. That's what will happen in your life. There are people, church, 
that have been deprived for a majority of their lives. And here's the game we play as Christians. One day, brother, maybe you'll be at this point. One day, sister, you'll be able to do this. The one day is right now, church. You don't have to wait. There is no prerequisite of how long you have to be a believer before the promises apply to you. The second you accept Christ as your Savior, the very second you say, God, come into my life, Lord, change me, that very second you can stand right there at the edge of your Red Sea and hold the staff out, which is faith and hope and grace and mercy and Scripture. You can hold those things out, and God will make a way for you to walk through there. You don't have to wait until next month. You don't have to wait until next year. You can do it right now today. If you've been waking up and facing that same giant just like David's brothers are, you all you have to do is run quickly to the battle line with the promises of Scripture in your head and your heart, and that giant falls down. <laughs> Church, the world needs revival. And we talk about it all the time. Man, I wish things would change. Oh my gosh, this world's in such a such chaos. I just wish God would move. Man, God, what's taking you so long? When are you going to fix all this stuff? Church, he's counting on us to do that. It's our job. We just want to sit down on the couch and wake up and, yep, God moved. He is going to move through you. We can't be lazy believers. We can't be lazy, wimpy Christians. And I know sometimes doing the things that Scripture asks us to do is scary because it doesn't make sense in our head. But guess what? If God made sense, He wouldn't be God at all. What makes Him God is He can make the impossible possible. Scripture tells us that. There is nothing impossible with God. Nothing. It's us that He works through. You are the next Moses. You are the next Joseph. You are the next story in Scripture that's going to change someone's perspective and change their life. Once you understand that, church, life takes on a whole new meaning. Mark talked about it this morning. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. Don't wait until tomorrow to share the gospel with someone. Share it today. Don't wait until tomorrow to run up to that giant that's been tormenting your family your whole life. Run up to that giant today. Do not waste one second on this earth. Church, this revival next week is just the beginning. Charleston, Mattoon, Coles County, they have no idea what's about ready to happen. They have no clue. That revival tent that'll be on Mattoon campus is just like that Red Sea. God's telling us all, run up there, run to that tent, hold the staff out and watch what I do. Watch the people I send to that tent, the people that maybe you don't even like right now. Oh God, don't send them. Yeah, send them, God. He's waiting on us. We sit here and we ask God all the time, what's taking you so long? That's the question he's asking us. What is taking you so long? Would you go tell people about me finally? And listen, don't walk through town telling people you believe in Jesus with a big frown and scowl on your face. Nobody wants that. I'm a Christian. Nobody wants that. Don't be embarrassed to share your valleys you've been through, church. That's what makes God, God. The world already knows you're imperfect. They know that. They already know everything you've done. They've read it in the newspaper. Tell them where you're at right now. Hey, listen to this. I used to be addicted to drugs. You tell them, now look where I'm at. Yep, remember me, the guy with five DUIs? Now look where I'm at. Yeah, I know I've been through divorces. Look where I'm at now. Yep. Yeah, you want to know how I get all this faith as I go through my treatments or my, or my bad medical prognosis? You want to know why I remain so hopeful? Let me tell you about Christ and what he's done in my life. People need the hope of the gospel, church, and many people in your life are not going to go read it themselves. You might be the only Bible anyone ever reads you in your life. 
Are you telling the story the way God wants you to tell it? Are you loving your enemies? My enemies? Yeah, your enemies. Are you loving them? It's one of the hardest things we're asked to do, church. Love the people that persecute us. Love the people that hate us back. Hard. Real hard to do. Love Cardinal fans. You're even supposed to love Cardinal fans. You talk about them. That's nearly impossible, God. Really? Yeah, love them. He says, I know they fall way short of the... I know. I know they fall way short of the mark, brother. Love them. Love them to the Cubs. There's no better example than that than Christ on the cross. As they drove the nails into his wrists and his feet, jabbed that spear in his side, spit on him, ridiculed him, shoved the crown of thorns into his skull as deep as they could get it, and he prays for their forgiveness. He prays for them. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. I know I find myself at the bottom of this well, and maybe it's your own family that sent you there. God, forgive them. They know not what they do. But I know you're pulling me out of this well. I know I'm coming out of here. And I'm coming out of here equipped with, equipped with a testimony that will save the very people that threw me here. Church, it's time we start taking our faith seriously. Being a Christian is an active thing. We're to be active participants in the process. We don't just sit by and let God do things to our lives. We allow God. We stand up off the couch and we run to the battle line. Maybe it's ours, maybe it's someone else's. And we allow God to do things through us, not to us. It's the same God, church. But now you're in the story. The question is, what impact am I going to make? Have I, have I become deprived? And if you have, it's not too late. Listen, if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, there's no better day than right now today. There is no better day than the Sunday before revival if you haven't accepted Christ to come on up here and do it. You do not have to walk out of this room not knowing where you're going after we leave this earth. This is not your home forever, church. We're temporarily passing by. And on our journey through here, it's our job to grab as many people as we can and share the gospel so that when we get up there, heaven is as full as it can possibly be. There will be someone in your life that you see up in heaven that says, thanks, brother. Because of your faith, because you had the guts to share the gospel with me when the world didn't want you to, that's why I'm here. That's why all of us have received salvation. At some point in time, somebody shared the gospel with me. Don't be selfish with God's promises. Don't charge people for what's been freely given to you. Grace, hope, mercy. Bring them to the cross. I don't care how broken they are. Some of us say, well, listen, when you finally get to this point, when you're finally sober, when you're finally out of bankruptcy, whatever it is, when you're finally remarried, then you can come with me. To no, bring them broken. Share the gospel, church. Do it today. Revival started in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Started at the very beginning of time. We sit here and we wait for revival. We're right in the midst of it. We're 2022 years into revival. And we're sitting here waiting for it to come. It's right here in front of us. We're the ones that are supposed to carry revival into the world. We sit here and wait for it to come to us. It's in us. We take it to the world. Start this evening. Start this afternoon. Right now. You start a revival. And you don't have to, you don't have to take care of the whole world. Start the revival in your house. I'll start the revival in my house. Nick will start the revival in his house. My parents in their house. My siblings in their house. And before you know it, the whole town's in revival. Then you take the revival to the next town. Church, you're in the Bible. You're in the Bible. Don't read and think, man, I wish I was like Moses. You're exactly like him. You were created the same exact way. There was nothing special about Moses. You know, the only thing special about Moses was the God he served. Guess what? You served the same God. 
There was nothing special about Noah. He was a drunk. There was nothing special about anybody in the scriptures except for Christ. So as long as you follow that Jesus Christ, your story is being written right now. What an honor. What an awesome responsibility. And what hope that brings to us knowing God's writing my story. And at the end of it, we win. Carry revival into your house today. Listen, if you've never prayed with your spouse, do it today. Do it at the dinner table. Someone pray with my spouse. That's awkward. Yeah, I know. First couple times, it's super awkward. Who cares? Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Your family's depending on you, your faith. Let's take it serious, church. God, we thank you for the word this morning. God, we thank you for the fact that we're right in the midst of revival. We thank you for the fact that you already wrote the instructions. All we have to do is read them and know that they apply to our lives, God. Lord, we thank you for the stories in Scripture. We thank you for, for what you did through Joseph's life. We, we thank you for what you did through Moses' life and Noah. God, we thank you for the fact that you're going to do the same exact thing through our lives. You're the same God now as you were back then in scriptures. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ on the cross. The blood that he shed for every one of us, we thank you for it. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for the empty tomb on that third day that gives every single human being on this planet the chance to live with you forever in heaven. God, give us the strength, the courage, the guts to make sure everyone around us knows that those promises of Scripture apply to their lives. God, allow us to be courageous, to stand firm in the face of a world of unbelievers and share the gospel until, until we take our last breath. God, we thank you for everyone here this morning. We thank you for this tent revival that's coming up in Mattoon. God, we thank you for the souls that are going to be saved in that tent. God, we thank you for the fact that this tent revival is not the finish line, but it's just the very beginning. Give us the stamina, Lord, to continue this revival long after September 9th. Allow us to take our faith seriously, Lord and to rely on you in our times of trouble, knowing that we're coming out of this well, knowing that we're crossing the Red Sea, knowing that we're gonna knock this giant down that stands right in front of us because of what your son, Jesus Christ, did for us on the cross and in that tomb. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.